welcome to episode 22 of the D2 Speedcast. We've got uh, myself and Darren here, and we're going to be joined by uh, Firestone's Kara Adams in a few minutes. But yeah, coming off of a uh, weekend off, um, we had a, we were at Mid-Ohio a couple weekends ago, and that was a bit of a up and down experience for us, but happy to be back on uh, back in Indy and going racing next weekend. Yeah, it was a... Uh... Interesting weekend, actually, probably some good topics for Tara with regards to the wet and dry mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, using the wets in those torrential conditions, in super cold conditions as well, right, um, in mid-Ohio. It was tough, tough again with the weekend for yourself as a rookie, only the, the short practice before qualifying and straight into races. Uh, you like that track and go very well there and qualified well and you know, ran well up in the top 15 in the in the second race, and uh, unfortunately had had that moment uh, that put put you out of contention. Yeah, eh? and then basically backed it off going through one and uh, damaged the under tray, and then after that it was just kind of an exercise and keeping the car on the track and trying to stay out of the way. It was a bit of a frustrating. <laughs> we, we we got a few good exercises, yeah. in, didn't we? With a bit, a bit of fuel bit of saving, rain, fuel yeah, saving. Yeah. Couple more pit stops. It was uh, it was it was all good, right? You know, just more experience as we're finding this year is uh, is pretty much all we all we can do at this point. But excited to get back to Indy for your for your second run on the road course this year. Yeah, I'm really excited. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Uh, the Harvest GP in Indy Road Course number two. This will be the official uh, first time that I think I've, I think they've done that they've done a back to back races at, a, at the same track in, in IndyCar, at least as far as I know, during during the same season, unless, unless, unless I'm wrong on that, but I don't, I don't think I am. Um, no, I don't think, they, I, you know, I can't remember a time when we've gone to the same track twice in the, in the same season, yeah. for sure. So that's going to be pretty exciting. Yeah. Planet Cat, how's it going? Speed versus speed, thanks for the, thanks for the <laughs> sub. Stroke Race 69, thanks for, thanks for showing up. Thanks for uh, all the support on, on Twitter and uh, for supporting the podcast. Really, really, really appreciate that. So we've got a special guest here 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 to, yeah, oh, here tonight. We've got lots of uh, had lots of questions in the past episodes about the tires, and uh, you know it's a complicated topic. And uh, you know, for, both from a driving standpoint with with the different compounds, and then from an engineering standpoint, and even in technical circles. Uh, Tire design, tire manufacturing can be seen as a bit of a, a dark art. So hopefully we can un unpack some of that. So we've got uh, Kara Adams here. We're gonna we've got a little video from our friends at Firestone, and then we'll get right into it. So here we go. There's a reason drivers have trusted Firestone tires since the very first Indy 500. Drivers like Karun Shaw. Voigt, Andretti, Rossi. Because while finishing is hard enough, it's winning that makes you a champion. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. All right. Yeah, those... Cara, Cara, welcome. Hi, Thanks for having me. Well, uh, is, this a, is, this a, is this a first you getting, getting into by a couple of racing, racing, racing drivers? drivers? I think it is. I think it is, yes. <laughs> Talked a lot of journalists, a lot of media, but yes, but yes. <laughs> well, we'll hopefully we'll, 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 we'll have, we'll have some, some fun with you, with you uh, here and, here and, and uh, get, 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 some get some good information going, 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 going forward and everything. And, everything, and, everything and, and so, you know, so, maybe, you know, we, can maybe start we can start by, by you, you can tell us a little bit. We saw that beautiful video. There's some pictures of you uh, poking tires with something and, and being in pit lane, you know, talking to us drivers all the time. Uh, uh, Oh, we got the echo yeah. going there, Dalton. Yeah, let me let me work on that. You guys, you guys keep talking. I think it should be okay. Still working through the sound okay. sound mix inside of running the <laughs> podcast. You can never quite figure it out. <laughs> That's all right. So yeah, maybe maybe you you can tell us a little bit about. We talked a little off air about uh, when you got started in in racing, kind of around my, my era a little bit. When I was kind of halfway through my career in in IndyCar. Tell, tell us a little bit about you know the how you kind of got started school work, school wise um, previous work and things. Well, I know Dal Dalton is a technical person, so I can get into some of this. Um, my <laughs> grandfather was actually an engineer for NASA. Oh wow! So oh, wow. growing up, I had always seen lots of stuff about space shuttles and all the science really interested me. My mom was a, a science teacher, so she had neighborhood science camps, and I always thought science was awesome. 
I, when I was growing up, I thought I wanted to be an astronaut, but it was right around the time where, you know, the space shuttle was just starting to, to, to go down when I got into college. And when I was in school for mechanical engineering, I walked into the machine shop that was designing and building a Formula SAE car. So for those of your followers that might know what Formula SAE is, it's like an Indy car, but smaller, runs on a 600cc a motorcycle smaller. engine, a lot yeah. smaller, yes. <laughs> well, and I've got a funny story about how small too, because my senior year, we, we designed the, the racing seat so small that all the guys could fit into it, but none of the females could actually sit in the car because it was way too narrow for female hips. <laughs> so... That was, that was fun, but I really, really liked doing the Formula SAE thing, and I thought, all right, wouldn't it be cool if I could actually get paid and do racing for a living? So I looked at a whole bunch of companies around that had automotive programs, and I'm from Akron, Ohio, so Firestone was a great fit. Looking at their involvement in racing, going back to the very first Indianapolis 500 in 1911, the Marmon Wasp drove to victory lane on Firestone tires, so you have that great connection there, so I figured... The motorsports history is probably safe with a company that goes back 100 years in racing. So I got started at the company. I, nobody, Not many people can actually start in racing. I started in our vehicle dynamics group. So I was solving what they call NVH problems, noise, vibration, harshness. So Dalton knows something a little, <laughs> little bit something about tire vibration. So, yeah, um, tire vibration. Now you're talking yeah. my language as that's well. That's right. That's, that's how I got started as I was looking at tire vibration on passenger cars and then handling on passenger cars. And I knew I wanted to work in racing. Um, you might go back to your time. Darren Page Meter was the, the manager yeah. of the, the group for Page, Firestone yeah. and Bridgestone. And I went and I introduced myself to him and I said, hey, I'm a new engineer here. I work in our vehicle dynamics team. I really want to work for racing. So what kind of skills or traits does your ideal engineer have? And he's like, well, nobody's ever asked that to me before. <laughs> and so... I was like, well, think about it. Let's talk in a couple weeks. And he came back and he said, all right, I want somebody who knows that vehicle dynamics, who can understand tire force and moment behavior and who can program. I'm like, all right, I've got one of the three. I've got a pretty decent vehicle dynamics background, but I'm gonna learn the other two. Long story short, the next time that there was an opening for a mechanical engineer, I went in there, I had the answer key, aced the test, started out engineering street course tires. So um, Darren, your last couple of years at Foyt, um, that was where my street course tires you were running on. Um, cool. Then I moved on to road course and rain tires, and then I designed the Indianapolis 500 tires in 2012 and took over the engineering organization, and now it's engineering and manufacturing. So all the technical processes of Firestone Racing, my wonderful team and I are, are run. So. Nice work. And how, how, how many are on that team? So we have a really relatively small team. So about four engineers, uh, mechanical engineers, a chemical engineer, a chemist, technicians, so those are all of the people that actually do the design work for the tires and the same people, Dalton, that you see out the racetrack mm -hmm. or your fans, your listeners, when you go out to race tire the track and you see people poking the tires, the engineers there are the same ones that are designing the tires. Of course, we have a support crew there too. And then we have about um, 40 to 50 men and women that are actually building the race tires. So anything from making sure the machines run well to preparing the materials to actually hand building and curing the tires those are all done in Akron as well yeah so that's an, an interesting question an interesting point about the actual construction of the tire because obviously for a for a commercial application like for everyday road tires you're making hundreds of thousands of them so that is probably pretty automated but are the race tires handmade or is it a mostly automated process they're mostly handmade so in a normal tire production plant you might build 40,000 tires in a day uh, we build about 30,000 tires 30,000 tires in a whole year. So they are very, very much hand-built. Um, there's a lot of automation in making sure the quality is mm -hmm. is good. But mm -hmm. the if you think about uh, laying a piece of fabric around a tire, at some point, those two pieces of fabric have to join each other. You don't want that splice to be very heavy because then you're going to have an area where you have heat and you could have a potential durability or a vibration issue. So because they're built by hand, we can control how big those are as mm -hmm. opposed to a big automated tire plant where you can get pretty close and pretty close is good enough, but pretty close is not good enough for 240 miles per hour. Not at the speedway. It's gotta be, it has nope. to be perfect or at least as close as we can get. And I think, you know, when, when we look at the uh, kind of the history of IndyCar and Firestone, obviously it's a, it's a very strong relationship. And when we look at the, the reliability of, of, of the tires this season, but even just historically, it's quite rare that you see 
there that that we have an issue that comes from a tire problem right usually it's a driver locking up or running over debris and getting getting a, a puncture but it's it's exceedingly rare that we actually have a tire failure which you know for the drivers is a huge confidence boost is when we're going at those speeds on on the oval you know we we really like knowing that we're we're, we're <laughs> you know that we're rolling on a solid product yeah we appreciate that if you talk to any one of my engineers they're so passionate and they take what we do so personally and so seriously that even if we have a, a race where people are complaining about vibration they're they're upset about it and they're like what are we going to do to fix this so um they they take it very seriously and, and i'm really really lucky to have a team a team of engineers that works with me awesome yeah no it's 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 clearly a great group and we you know we'd love having you guys at the at the at the track so the the at track support team you know as you mentioned you have the, the technicians right are changing balancing mounting tires you have the engineers taking in data feedback from drivers and teams and your techs on on pit lane taking temps handing those to engineers you know what 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 data are are you pulling from a race weekend to then kind of work back into your into your process so when we're there our, our job is really data gathering we want to make sure everything Everything's running right with the tires. People have the tires on the right positions, um, which didn't happen at Mid Ohio, and I'm not going to mention the driver <laughs> that it happened to. But right mm. after qualifying for the first race, um, the the team somehow managed to put the right rear on the left rear and the left rear in the right rear. And Dalton, I don't know if you've ever driven in a situation no, like that, but you don't want to yeah. do it. It's, it's very didn't look fun. Instead of the tires trying to help stabilize the car, it goes the opposite oh, wow. direction. So, yeah, no, that's, um, it, that, that's interesting to talk. We can maybe come back to that point here in a sec. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're making sure the tires are in the right positions. We're making sure um, nobody's doing anything crazy with, with cambers or with pressures. Mm. Um, we've got a great camber story for later, too. Uh, so there's, there's a, a, lot of, um, a lot of stuff that we're doing just to make sure that the tires are safe. So first and foremost, we want to make sure they're in a, a safe operating condition. But we're, we're getting temperatures every time the car comes in during practice. Our technicians are over the wall. Our engineers are over the wall, getting the tire temperatures in three positions. This you would give a sheet back to the race teams, and they're able to look at the race the tire sheets, and they're able to say, all right, based on the difference between the inside and the outside and the right front, I might not have enough camber in here, or I might have too much camber in because the differential is too yeah. big. So they're able to look at those and kind of know historically what those should be, or ask us if they don't know what they should be. Um, you've got some great engineers on the on the Foyt team that have a lot of history with IndyCar and they're able to look at those and say, all right, we know based on this track that we really should be at this percent differential between the inside and the outside. Um, mm -hmm. And they might make some setup changes based on that. Um, we're making sure the pressures look good. And when, after the race weekend, we often call the engineers and we ask for a data set. So like you, we use Pi data systems, as you know, in IndyCar, um, we get that full data set. So we're looking at Acceler lateral accelerations, longitudinal accelerations, loads, speeds, steering traces, all kinds of stuff that we're able to take that back and analyze the tires after the fact and then look at some of the driver feedback, mm -hmm. see if we can correlate that to what the, the Pi data is telling us to see, you know, what is the feedback maybe biased towards this because the car was set up towards this direction or, mm -hmm. you know, it helps us say, all right, really for next year, we should bring something that has a little less exit understeer. You know, maybe we can work on this part of the tire to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. has, that has that been tough this year with with the situation that we're in? I, you, we saw back at Texas, right, where, uh, you know, normally a, 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 a pit stop stint would have been 60 laps or something, but with the lack of time on track, lack of testing, potentially tire testing, um, you know, I think was that a, a mandate that you guys talked to the league and said, look, we need to probably come together and all agree to not go more than, what was it, 35 laps or whatever. Yeah, everything's been difficult this year, Darren. Um, everything <laughs> yeah. from entire production to what we're doing at the track to how we're socially distancing to the, the ban banners and the things that are up in our trailers to keep us from getting germs on each other. Um, but as you well know, we first learned about the how serious COVID actually might be while we were down at St. Mm -hmm. Pete the first mm -hmm. time. <laughs> and when yeah. we came back uh, after that event, uh, we were following what the state of Ohio said, and we shut down our tire production facility to make sure all of our teammates were safe. So, you know, we always talk about driver safety, driver safety, but our teammate safety is, is right there with it. We want to make sure 
that they are safe first and foremost. So um, along with the state of Ohio, we shut down the plant. We had everybody go home until we could get the plant up to the point where we could make sure that there was plenty of social distance between all the stations and that it was safe to do so. And along the lines with the government in the area to make sure that that was, that was safe and that was the right thing to do. So because of that, we didn't, we actually, Darren did all the testing. We had a, a great test where we learned a lot about what we should do for Texas. And in fact, that's what we're going to be doing for next year. But there wasn't time to build the tires that we had designed and engineered specifically for the track. So what we ended up doing was we used tires that were backup tires from the previous year, which were still you know, safe and, and durable, but at the same time, we knew what the tires were and we knew the limitations of the tires. And we're probably overcautious at times because again, I talked about driver safety. You know, mm -hmm. These drivers are family to us. So we would never want to put somebody in a situation that's that's not safe. And we looked at everything with IndyCar and we decided, all right, this is probably too conservative, but we're going to go 35 laps. And we worked with the series to say, all right, how can we best make it work with the inventory we had? So we had some leftover Indianapolis tires. These actually were for Indianapolis. Um, really? And we were building them for for the Speedway. So this is this is, these are ones that would have been used this year, but there was going to be 36 sets used initially. And we, we didn't come close to using 36 sets at Indy this year. Um, <laughs> so we had all of those those left side tires, um, and we hadn't built the left side tires that we were planning on building. And then we had the the Texas backups from the year before. So we just we had a solution that we could make work. It's not ideal. We err on the side of driver, driver safety, so that's where the 35 laps came in. No, I think that's the you know it's definitely the right approach, right? Like I said, it, it might be overcautious, but that's probably given that the, the tires are you know are, are arguably the most critical part of the setup. That that's the, that that makes sense to take that take that caution. Um, so you kind of brought up an interesting point, like the the turnover in terms of, of time from when you get data to when you up, either up, update a, a current spec or make a new tire. Like what's what is that? process look like? like how, how many weeks it, does it take from I've made this change to my design to here's a new compound that we can go test or race? So it really depends on the scale of the race, how many tires there are in the scale of the change. So something like Indianapolis, when we are there for typically in May or August or whatever we're calling this year, we're focused on what what we're going to bring next year. So whenever we're at the track, all that data we're, we're capturing it's somewhat for the teams, but a lot of it is to drive our design decisions for the next year. Something like a compound change where it's gonna be a similar compound to something that we've done before, we can make a uh, change relatively quickly. Um, if we need to run, rush into a new production of something, usually we can, hap we can make it happen. Um, we made Texas happen after the, the, the design, we had a, a test and probably two months later we had the race. So we yeah. don't like to do that, that's a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. on our production mm -hmm. it's a lot of you, you you create a lot of waste when you do that but that's we can do that when we when we need to but you know typically we've already started our 2021 production already oh. because we had um a, you know we're, we're done with 2020 st pete we made st pete tires way back in january so we're good for yes. st pete um and indianapolis grand prix we finished making those a couple of weeks ago so you can have anything from a, in, in the, in the, if there's a really, really a huge need, we could probably have a three week turnaround for a small quantity of tires. Um, but typically it's a lot longer design process. If we're making a significant construction change, that's usually more of a year development. Okay. If we're, if we're making something that's significantly different, like you'll see at Texas yeah. next year. So that, so that, and that kind of, kind of brings us to a question that's actually been asked in the, in, in the chat about, you know, are all the tires the same? So, you know, is it one ro one one oval tire and one road course tire, or, or is it track specific, and, and why so? Yeah, so it's it's definitely track tracks as Darren alluded to before. It's position specific. So this year we've had a lot less specifications than what we've had previous years, just because we've tried to make as many common tires as we can, and we've had less track types. We've been to Indianapolis Grand Prix um, a couple times, so we're going to have mm -hmm. two more races. So we've had a lot of double race weekends, but last year we had 64 different tire specifications. Wow. Wow. So we try to make tires as common as, as we can because that makes it easier on drivers and engineers to know, all right, mm -hmm. the St. Pete tire is the same as the Long Beach tire, is the same as the Detroit <laughs> tire, I know this tire. 
um, and the same thing with road courts. Not, not have... always a good thing, Cara, for equality throughout. No, no, <laughs> I, that's true. I think you you drove Edmonton, and I don't think our street course tire was ever great at Edmonton. That was oh also my gosh, tire, that was but... a bumpy old, bumpy old track. And tires do play a part in 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 riding bumps. It's not just just grip, right? right is yes, it? absolutely. And that that goes to my next point of the street course tire. You don't need to have an oval tire at a street course if you try to run. Indianapolis right side tires at Sebring, you would be very angry. You would say, what did you do? Why did you bring this tire? I don't like it. Um, yeah. it it's too hard. It's too durable. It doesn't have, it doesn't allow you to have the wind up. So at street courses, at, it's a place like Long Beach, you're going 35 miles per hour and you're, you're, you're down in 35 miles per hour at the keyhole and you have to accelerate quickly. Mm -hmm. If you had something like an Indianapolis right side tire, you would just spin. The, the tire has no <laughs> no radial comply or the longitudinal compliance so um, it doesn't have that wind up with a street course tire it's very soft mm -hmm. you're able to deflect the tire a lot so that allows you to get that braking and that acceleration too so street course tires are a different construction anytime you see the car out on track four different constructions and like somebody who i won't mention last week found mm -hmm. out you don't want to put the right from the left and the left on the right because it destabilizes the car instead of stabilizing the car so uh, imagine putting oval tires on in on the car instead of indie tires. That would be kind of like the feeling. The constructions are quite yeah, different. Yeah, that would be. Uh, yeah, and that's harrowing. not something that happens on a on a road car, is it? You know, with with regard, like you can you nearly can ro rotate, rotate tires, the tires right? and. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And as, unless they have mismatched fronts and rears, yeah. but yeah, absolutely. Cool. So and then on an oval tire, as you guys know, we have stagger. So a short track, you want it to stagger the difference between the left side tires, which are smaller, and the right side tires. So left side tires inside, they're smaller. So I would take my, my glass here and rotate it for you, but it's full of water <laughs> and that would not be good. Um, but if you think of the, the larger the larger being the outside and then the smaller being the inside, you're going to rotate that around and uh, it's going to make the car want to turn. So if you have the, think about the differential in the rear being more locked on an oval, it's just going to naturally want to make that car rotate. Yeah, and that's actually one of the, the tools that the teams have to have to work with is we'll you know, get the stagger measurements and we'll know where our sets are at. And then as we're you know either going into qualifying or as the balance is shifting during the race, you know we can have high and low stagger sets and, and you know we'll test that in the days leading up to qualifying and and and, and the race and kind of know the effect on the, on the car's balance and then have that as a tuning tool during the race, which is obviously a good thing. Mm -hmm. right. gives, gives us some yeah, because I'm sh I'm sure a lot of you know there's still manufacturing tolerances even though you're only making a few dozen a day, you know by hand there there are still manufacturing tolerances that you can't get away from right. So you could is that right? You send yeah. us what you think are all the same stagger, but the teams will measure them themselves and find you know we're all trying to get small advantages, aren't we? Right. And assigning staggers at a place like Indianapolis is a nightmare, as you can ask my mm -hmm. my uh, oval tire design engineers. Uh, you're basically going through. And if you know what um, Dalton knows what I'm talking about, and you probably do, too, a, a normal distribution where you have uh, a bulk of tires in the middle and then you have some on the outsides and some on the wings. You want to make sure you have that same distribution on the left side tires and the right side tire. So you can say, all right, I'm going to give you a. 25.96 and 26.12 and the next person gets one one different from that so everybody gets mm -hmm. the same stagger but they might be getting different sizes mm -hmm. so yeah. it can turn into a little bit of a nightmare <laughs> when you have 33 cars and you don't know which cars are going to be in the top 10 or top nine and get an extra set and you don't know who is or who are going to be last chance and get extra sets there so mm -hmm. we're doing a lot of predicting and, and guessing so Usually the, the, they're within a, a certain range, but uh, engineers can play around with uh, some of the smaller ones and some of the bigger ones to, yes. to get the maximized um, differential and you know, maybe run a, a smaller stagger in some situations and a bigger stagger if the car balance changes. Yeah, copy. Why don't we take a, a couple questions from the comments. Actually, this is a pretty interesting one from Merrick Speed. Uh, Cara, with the air screens adding some 50 pounds to the car and changing the COP, how has this affected tires at various tracks? Any effect, good effects, bad effects, surprising effects? And actually, just to add to that, it, it shifted the the car's CG forward. I think it's about se about seventy pounds weight, so mass. So, what do, what, yeah, so what what have you seen this year? Has has it been been anything that has surprised you guys as far as what you've 
experience at at track and in, in testing? Yeah, so our initial simulation work said it was going to be a little bit bigger of a change than we actually expected, but the aerodynamic drag ended up being bigger than what mm -hmm. we had assumed it would be too. So okay. we, we did have a quite a big increase of load on some of the positions. So if you were running an aeroscreen car versus a non-aeroscreen car at 200 miles per hour, you'd have a lot more load on the right front. But because the aeroscreen is adding so much drag, at some tracks, that percentage of load increase that we thought we'd see, like Texas was one where we actually did a simulation of moving the CG forward and higher. And so that's a bigger thing. It's not just the fact that it's more, moving more forward, but it's also higher. So on an oval, you get more weight transfer. So the, the, there's, that adds a lot of dynamic to how you go about approaching how, what tires you would put on a car and it adds a lot more weight to that right front. So if you have um, similar speeds, you're going to have a lot more load on the, the right front. But again, because the car is slowed down quite significantly, um, the effect is not quite as big as what we had expected, what we had modeled for, and what we had tested for. So it's still a lot. Um, and the other, the other position, surprisingly, you wouldn't think that it beats up on as much as the inside front tire. Huh. So at a road course or an oval, because what happens is you end up having less load on that inside front tire, which essentially means you're dragging it. And whenever uh, you're dragging mm -hmm. it, you can be in a situation if the compound is soft and you're dragging it, you can end up wearing it unevenly. So mm -hmm. if you're dragging it, you're wearing it more. And if you happen to have a suspension set up that's not quite even, you can end up wearing it unevenly. So mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the things that we've found a little bit more this year that we haven't had in the past is maybe a little bit more less that left front wear. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, again, because we're dragging it a little bit more. So as our approach going into next year, we're looking at what kind of compounds we're using on the left front and the right front and making them match a little bit better. Well, there you go. There's always some unintended consequences, right? That's that's Absolutely. the engineering design process. You got to keep iterating and working through it. And as well, you know, you obviously you've got the, the, the driver and and team developing the, the car setup around that aero screen problems and differences as well uh so that you know you know springs shocks all like trying to control that mass i'm sure that you you you've got to try and keep up with that ever evolving you know driving and and speed differences some teams are getting a, a good a good handle on on how to control it better than others and maybe they're working with the tires better so um definitely going to be interesting challenge for you and the teams yeah you're absolutely right that's why we can't do simulations in a vacuum yeah. we can't <laughs> as the tire people say all right we're going to simulate this and this is the effect that the aero screen is going to have because somebody from somebody from Foyt or somebody from coin or somebody from ganassi is going to figure out a way to get around some of the inherent i won't call them issues but inherent characteristics of the car and yeah. they're going to be able to put more load into it or put, put less load into it. And sometimes you found out, find some at, yeah. crazy stuff. Exactly. <laughs> Indianapolis this year was, was absolutely crazy. Um, and in fact, Dalton, I think it might've been on one of your cars. It was either your car or one of the other, the Foyt cars. Um, but it was, a uh, one of the engine manufacturers had done a simulation that said, if you stand up the left rear tire, it gets out of the airstream and you can end up, having significantly less drag at the expense of tire durability, but you can have significantly <laughs> less drag if you hide it out mm -hmm. of the airstream. Air so yeah, we, were, up, yeah. we were looking at these, these tires and going, what is going on? We haven't ever <laughs> seen anything like this. And if we start seeing something that we haven't seen before, uh, the, a lot of the things that if it's somebody standing in the pit box, the tendency is saying to say something's wrong with this tire. But, <laughs> but for us, we say, okay, what is different? And so I started seeing this on one or two cars, and then I started seeing it on three or four cars, and then I started seeing on in most cars of one manufacturer besides one team. So mm. I started looking at what's in common with these all of these cars, and I start looking at the left rear tire, and it, it's, it's almost stood up. That doesn't make sense. You're not going to get optimal grip from standing the tire mm. up. Um, so I, I started asking some of the teams that, you know, that were doing this, you know, why are you doing this? And nobody would tell me. So... Sometimes as a tire engineer, you have to figure out things <laughs> for yourself. Play detective. And what I actually did is, I, <laughs> yes, I, I, I figured out that it was the left, obviously it's the left rear, nobody's doing it. And I went to the one team from that engine manufacturer 
that wasn't doing it. And I said, all right, here's what I think is happening. Can you, can you confirm or deny what I think is happening? <laughs> He's like, yeah, actually, you're right, because somebody did the simulation and they said, you're going to get this much less drag if you do that. But obviously, you only want to do it for qualifying because mm -hmm. you could end up blistering the tires. Mm -hmm. So right. we had, and the only, there's, you learn from, you learn from history, right? Which yes. yep. About five years ago at Phoenix, I was working with one of a, a car, a multi-car team, and I was looking at this car, and the left front tire was blistering. And not only was it blistering, it was blistering on the inside of the tire. And mm. you guys know ovals, if you're looking at the front of the car, mm -hmm. um, the, the tires are, are tilted in towards the tops, towards this inside of the track. And so you would think if, they, if it blisters, it's going to be on the outside. Well, this particular tire was blistering on the inside, which didn't make any sense. So the first thing, I see the tire off the car, and I think, okay, this is weird. Do we have a tire issue? Is there something going on? There's, there's blisters right around the edge of the tire. So I went and I talked to the team engineer, and this was the very first practice session. He said, okay, thanks, we'll, we'll take a look at it. Um, and then I was really busy, I was with other cars, and I went back to that car later, and I looked at the, the wear on the inside of the tire, and I'm like, something's not right here. Walked around to the, to the front of the car, and I realized the tire's almost standing straight up. So I talked to the engineer, I was like, hey, can you tell me what the camber on your left front position is? So he's like, oh, it's 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 1.8. I was like, are you sure? The positive 1.8? He said, yeah, it's 1.8. I was like, all right, it doesn't seem right, but um, if you're sure, that's it. Okay. So next session comes out and he blisters the same spot of that same tire, and I was like, all right, I, you know, I, I'm looking at this car and I don't think your 1.8 is right. Can you come back behind and you, can you look at it with me? And he's like, no, I'm looking at the setup sheet. This is what we engineers do. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. My computer no, says it, this. It says it right here. This is what it is. And, and that's what I've got. So he, he, says, he says, no, no, that's what it is. I'm like, okay, fine. The next one blistered. And then finally, I, I went over to one of my other, other engineers. And I was like, I'm not sure. I don't think he's not listening to me because I'm female. I just I don't think he's listening to me. Come over with me while I have this conversation. So we went over to the engineer. After the session, we said, you know, come out of your pit box. Let's look at the tire together. Let's look at the car together. That is not 1.8 degrees of camber. If anything, it's slightly negative. And he looks at it, and, you know, if you've ever seen an engineer look at camber or if you've looked at camber, <laughs> what do we do? We do. Yeah, squint. Okay, yeah. We, we'll tilt our heads a little bit. We're like, yeah, okay. Get the, the and old he eye tilts his head, He tilts his head, and he goes, <laughs> yeah. oh, no. So anyway, race comes. They're late to the grid, and they've actually – they're late to the grid, grid because they they found found the problem. Uh -oh. So the chief engineer comes up later and says, "Hey, we figured out what the problem. Why your tires are blistering?" I'm like, "Oh, did you figure out the problem?" <laughs> there you yeah. go. Lo behold. We had a road course steering arm. Oh on. no! Oh wow! So, That's crazy. Huh. So that long-winded story. Just it's a good it's a good lesson to us engineers. Yeah, no, that, working with working with knowing the teams, working with yeah, teams. Well, that, yeah, that that yeah. process of how the engineers and the mechanics, you know, because how, how how the setup goes out, you know, set down and then you find out what's actually on on, on the car and all that. And over, over the years, I think you know, Darren and I have definitely definitely experienced it. You you get some engineers that are super techy computer in their Excel sheets <laughs> and everything, and it's like, but you you, you and then oftentimes. It's like you have to step step out of the engineering room and see what's actually going on on the actual race car, and, you know. It's it's, it's like example. the best of both worlds, right? Like you you still need the the hands on side of it, right? You can't just you can't just right. trust what the what the what the what the computers say. Um, so I, I want to hop back to a question because you're obviously a big a big advocate for STEM. You do you do lots of work with Firestone Outreach, and, and you're an inspirational figure for girls that want to get into racing, into engineering. Um, so Atlantic Cat asked, what advice would you give a young woman looking to become a race engineer that you wish somebody had given you earlier? Right. So I, I would say reach out and talk to somebody. Um, if you can find, there are so many great engineers, uh, female engineers in IndyCar even. Uh, this year we had 10 different engineers working on either uh, we had two at Firestone, we have one at Honda, we have one at Cosworth, and several at race teams. So find one of these people, chat with them, ask them questions. I think one of the biggest things is asking questions. There's a, a young lady where I worked with, I worked with her at Milwaukee for the first time. That gives you a sense of how long ago it was. <laughs> but she was a junior in high school or a sophomore in high school at the time, and she just, she wanted to know about engineering and about racing and 
Um, she wanted to be an engineer when she grew up. And so I added her to Facebook and kind of mentored her throughout the years. Um, she's actually, she's worked with Arms Up Motorsports. She degreed, she graduated with a degree in engineering. Um, and she's, she actually is an engineer for Harley Davidson okay. now. Uh, Nurse Cerny is her name. But I would say ask lots of questions. So work hard. Um, find out if you are still in school. Try to be part of a Formula SAE mm -hmm. or a Baja or some kind of student design competition where you're actually working on cars. Don't be afraid to work for free. Don't be afraid to, you know, when I, when I did all that studying to get this race engineering position, that was on my own time. I bought textbooks with my own money after I wasn't in school and I didn't need to have textbooks anymore. I bought textbooks when I studied, when I was on the airplane, when I was at home. Mm -hmm. um, that's basically what I did for two years. I would sit down and watch TV and I would have my race car vehicle dynamics Millican book I've out. I've got a copy of that. Right, right I was there, there say, looking, looking at it. <laughs> It's a, it's a great book. The Tire and Vehicle Dynamics book by Fajeka is also a good book. There's a lot of great ones. So, so read, study, ask questions. Uh, racing is a lot about connections. It's about who yeah. you know. And sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, getting that right connection um, and, and figuring out what, what's best for school. So mechanical engineering is great. If you're from the Indianapolis area, IUPUI has a motorsports engineering mm -hmm. program. Um, yeah. Mechanical engineering is great. Electrical you can be an engineer in a race team, um, chemical. There's a lot of stuff that you can yeah. do too. And you brought up a great point. IndyCar is very open, you know, a, a, compared to other major sports. I think the fans have a great access to the athletes and the teams. You know, it's like, and if people have questions, they can. You know, I, I every now and then we'll get a DM on Instagram where someone is asking, you know, how do how do I get in in involved in racing or how do I, you know, get, work for a team and all that. And I, and even you know, for for me, you know, with my engineering background, I, I was actually involved with Formula SE as well. When I was going through school, I was the lead designer, team um, team manager at, at Queens, and I have guys that are on, well, guys and, and girls that are on that team still, and they're, you know, they're keeping in touch with me and they're doing, like, doing the alumni yeah. design review That's and all great. that. And you now I've, I've, I've tried to help people out and see if, you know, like you said, trying to get, inter get internships and all that. And, it can be hard to find a position, and it's one of those things that if if, if, if you really want to do it, it'll it, it won't be easy because, like you said, the uh, you know positions don't just come up all 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 the time. And one thing that I've said to people that, that I think uh, holds merit is, you know, IndyCar may may be the end goal, but working for a junior team, kind of cutting your teeth mm -hmm. there, learning there, right? Learning if the the, the road life, if the the IndyCar racing circus is something you even want to do at a, at a maybe lower stress environment of a USF 2000 team or a you know, F1600 or Indy Pro 2000 sports team, car, sports car. cars yeah. would be a good way to just to dip your toe in the water. And there, there's, there's more teams and probably more available positions there. And so that, that would be a good place to look. And it may be as simple as finding a, a team on, uh, you know, on, on, on the internet, sending them a message on their social media or finding their, finding their email, yeah. or just getting, getting in touch, like I said, reaching out, asking questions. That's the, right. No, I, th I think you're absolutely right. Both of you guys, you know, even, even for us, Dalton, I think we've talked about part of doing this. I know it started off evolving from COVID and I racing and, and, and trying to engage fans and give updates and things give some, we're trying to give something back, right? And thank you, Cara, for, for, for coming on because, you know, and this is this is what motor racing is all about for me. I think you, 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 you know, like you said, you talked to Paige and, and the guys that, you know, went and asked questions and, 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 and interacted with those people. If people are on here interacting with us, hopefully maybe we can we can help one or two people, if not, if not yeah. more. And I think throughout motor racing, nearly every team uh, we're they're all they all love motor racing there's okay maybe one or two grumpies out there maybe <laughs> but <laughs> they're out there but most people love motor racing right and they want to help and like for example don't man, we, we've come across several interns at race teams at andretti and foyts that have turned into full-time engineers yeah, yeah so the IUPUI motorsports program that's where they 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 pull a lot of people there through for, for andretti yeah yeah. yeah, I mean, Amanda Gross is yep. a, a successful IUPUI graduate who I think the first time I met her was at a tire test, maybe at Texas, mm -hmm. where she was sitting there and 
hitting the numbers every time a car went by as a lap time. That was what she was <laughs> yeah. doing, and now she's doing yeah. great work on uh, Brian's fit box. Yeah, no, that's really, <laughs> that's 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 really cool to see for sure. Um, so kind of, I guess, from the larger picture for Firestone, one, one one question I have is, what's the you know, obviously we we all love racing, right? This is what we all want to do, but. What is what is Firestone's goal, right? With with the racing program, what is it like? How does it benefit the the road tire? Is is there crossover in terms of crossover. stuff that you'll learn on on the racing program? Is it training personnel? Is it uh, marketing or kind of an all uh, all of the above? What's so what's the actual benefit here for you guys? So it's a little bit of everything with IndyCar in particular. The tires are so different. We don't have to worry about snow, um, but we do have to go 240 miles per hour. We don't have to worry about road noise. I'm not going to noise treat my rain tire. Um, but at the same time, we have to worry about um, cornering and accelerating with uh, the amount of horsepower and the amount of torque that our wheels see. We have to worry about rim slip and we don't have to worry about some of the other things that passenger tires need to worry about. Um, we're only going to run 100, 200 miles on a on a <laughs> tire at the most part, and not a hundred thousand mile warranty. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of differences in what goes into a tire. There's a couple common components. The idea of the tire design is basically the same. We don't use all the components that a passenger car does, but we use some components that a passenger car doesn't. We use a lot more lightweight components than a regular passenger tire. You're not going to see very much steel in our race tires. So there's a, there's a big, big difference in what they look like. But where the similarities are is the people that are designing it and how we design and how we do a lot of our virtual modeling. Okay. So back um, in 2002, 2003, 2004, those years we were not doing any virtual tire design. Um, if you would have talked to any of our tire design engineers and talked about Abacus or... Mm -hmm anything like that, um, their eyes would have glazed over. Finite element analysis, no, we just know we need to change this angle by two or three degrees and it's gonna <laughs> fix the understeer problem. Sometimes we still need that common sense that it, well, let's just change the angle by two or three degrees and fix the understeer. But at the same time, maybe the right answer is two and a half degrees. And mm. without being able to run a design of experiments in a very cheap and cost-effective manner, we might not know what that ideal angle is. So there's a lot more we work we do with virtual modeling, and those are the same tools that are used to design Bridgestone and Firestone passenger tires. And there are certain things that we do. Um, most passenger tires, when we start, started a lot of our modeling, there wasn't an ability to measure camber or model camber. Well, it's very important. If I'm gonna model a, a race tire at zero degrees versus four mm -hmm. degrees of inclination angle or camber, that's gonna have a really big difference on the lateral force capacity of a tire or how well it turns. Um, where I'm not going to want to do a durability model at zero degrees, I'm going to want to do it at four mm -hmm. degrees. Mm -hmm. So if I am I able to model those things, so we push the limits of our technology and what we're able to do, and then along comes somebody in, in an agricultural tire and saying, oh, you know, I always wanted to run camber, but we didn't have the possibility. Mm -hmm. So now we've pushed the boundaries in racing, we're able to take that into ag or into a high performance passenger car. That being said, there's a lot of crossover in our engineers too. So. I started in passenger cars and I moved into racing and then I did a very short stint with truck and bus tires, trying to make sure we understood the totality of production and how we designed a, a truck and bus tire before I moved back into racing. Mm -hmm. Because like you, I like race, race cars. <laughs> um, that's what I wanted to do when I started out. And that's, I'm really lucky I'm here. I've kind of dug my, dug my fingers into it and um, you're gonna have a hard time getting me out of racing. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, a lot of our other passenger design engineer, other race tire design engineers, we have one that worked on huge mining tires before he worked into racing. So there's a lot of a lot of crossover that we see. Um, it helps train people. You don't want any. You don't want somebody that only does racing because that's not a very deep view. You don't have a good idea of how mm. you solve problems on other types of mm -hmm. tires. So yeah. it, it gives us a little bit more rich background. And then those people that leave racing are able to go in to do other things. Are the manager before me, Dale Harrigal, which you probably interacted with. He's now our chief engineer for our trade tire design. Mm -hmm. So if you go out and buy a, a replacement tire for one of your cars and it's a Bridgestone tire, it's a good chance that he's had a hand in it. So there's there's a lot of a lot of technology transfer there. Of course it's for marketing too. I mean 
we wouldn't be doing this if we couldn't sell passenger cars, uh, passenger car tires out of it too, but we get other benefits from it too. Great. Well, now we awesome. love that you guys are involved and you know, Firestone's been a great partner for IndyCar for a long time. I mean, since the first Indy 500 and you know, we're very excited to see that continue and grow. And it's, it's, a, it's a great, great relationship for sure. Andy Kerr is a phenomenal partner. We love Jay Fry and his team. They do a phenomenal job. They are. And next year, we're going to have a street course in the, I guess not the hometown, but at least for the more corporate office, right? The sort of hometown yeah. in, in Nashville. That's going to, going to be pretty exciting. Looking forward to yeah, that Yeah, that's one. where uh, Lisa, Roderick, Rachel, and team are, are based out of is Nashville. And um, I'm sure there are going to be the people that are going to be in the corporate office that because you can see you the can racetrack. See it? Oh, from that's there. cool. <laughs> yes. So on my on my Instagram, I got really excited when I saw the the course layout. I actually last year, right around September, mid September last year, I was down there for some meetings, and I almost ran the racetrack. <laughs> I, I ran over this pedestrian bridge, but that's my deal when I stay downtown Nashville. Is I'll leave my hotel, run over the pedestrian br bridge, and do loops around the Titan Stadium. Okay. So how bumpy I know is that it? route very well. Yeah, how bumpy? Give us some ideas. I wish I could science. remember. I wish I could remember. You might have better luck <laughs> talking to Rachel about yeah. that. But I was trying to remember what that looked like and what the pavement looked like. And I'm thinking, why didn't I pay attention to the road? Like, maybe if I was more tired and I was staring at the road <laughs> because I couldn't run anymore, that I would have been, I would have remembered. But. And now, just as like a last sort of question, that's actually an interesting point. And that's something that you guys do before the race begins, right? You have a team that goes out and analyzes the, the tracks and surface and for friction and the kind of microstructure, macrostructure of the, you know, whether it's yeah. smooth and pebbles and all that. And so that data that then goes out to the teams, how, you know, what, what, what's involved with that whole process? So there's two types of data we look at, Dalton. One is actually looking at, like you said, the micro and the macro structure. So we use a blue light laser that can pick up many frequencies of the spectrum. So we're, we're looking at it, we're basically getting a 3D map, like a waterfall map mm -hmm. of what that surface looks like. Cool. And so our smart engineers who can program better than I can, can look at that data and they can say, all right, based on this, here's the frequency spectrum of this sample. And they're able to say, all right, based on this, here's the macro structure, here's the micro structure. And we give those data to our team, so either in the raw data file or give values to the team. And one of the things that helps teams do is figure out how much heat needs to go into the tires on a warm-up. Mm -hmm. So if you are able to maximize the, uh, the the data that you get, you're able to look at the macro and micro and say, all right, we might need to actually, our first outing, a couple outings, we might need to actually put more heat in the tires because of the, the nature of the surface. So that's the one aspect we use. That's what we started out doing. It's We found it's useful for some teams. Not all teams know how to use it or not all teams have the capacity mm -hmm. of using it. But the other thing we give out is a direct surface traction measurement. So mm -hmm. it's it looks like a, um, I don't know, a snow blower that has two wheels. <laughs> we, we push it around and it has a, it has a one wheel that's free to rotate and one wheel that, that drags. It's on a belt and mm -hmm. it drags. And on that belt, it actually measures the, the force between there. And we're able to come up with a, a grip measurement. So a mu, if you hear, hear about surface mu, um, we're able to come up with the amount of friction that is on that race surface. And it's useful in a lot of different ways. So we can compare one track to the other. We can track, compare one track over time. Uh, with Texas, uh, we went when we went to Texas, we found that that really dark patch that had the track mm -hmm. bite that was put down and it was yeah. and it was dragged with tires. Well, when we went out to measure that surface, there's a, a couple different things. There's the, the dark surface, which makes tires generally a little bit more greasy over it because there's more mm -hmm. heat. So you maybe have a 20 degree differential between the dark black asphalt and the amount the area around it. But the rubber had been there so long and it had been weathered and dirt and everything so much that the amount of friction there, even when it was the same, even when it was darker, when it, if it was the same color, was lower. So it was lower okay. by about 15%. So it's one of the things like right at the start of the race weekend, we sent a message to, to Jay Fry, to Bill Pappas and said, hey, you guys need to know that there, that spot out there, it's mm -hmm. bad. <laughs> like, yeah, you you need there. to know it's bad. <laughs> so um, we were able to get that out data out to them. Um, and then you could see what happened was, you know, during qualifying, I think Sato was the one that had the incident. Mm -hmm. And then even at the end of the yeah. race, when everybody thought, all right, it's cool out, you know, 
It's dark, but it's the same. But we're going to be fine. To people and it was Tribes really, really. Don't listen to you to anybody <laughs> either. Remember that. <laughs> and then I think it was two years ago. I don't know if you were running in, in lights at yeah, the time. Two or three years ago, um, there was that that patch that they resurfaced. That was in was that turn ten where um, they had done some some patching the year before, and then there was one patch that had, it, it was again, it was about 20% less grip. Mm -hmm. And so we did that surface scan, and this is back before we processed all the data on the race weekend. We did that surface scan and we're like, oh, that's interesting, that's a whole lot less grip. So we sent it to maybe, uh, maybe IndyCar, but we didn't send it out to the teams mm -hmm. because it was just like, okay, we were learning about it. And then, mm -hmm. you know, very first thing, first practice session, everybody is spinning going straight. <laughs> We're like, whoa, what, what happened? What happened there? And it was just really an interesting learning for us. Oh, that's really cool. I mean, there's so much data that goes into the sport. I mean, actually, uh, Amo, Amo Turo asked, does IndyCar uh, slash Firestone have any sort of signal processing, data signal processing internships or programs? And I'm, I'm sure that definitely applies to what you're, what you're talking about here. Um, so I'm not sure that that's exactly, I think that's something that our, our engineers would mm -hmm. do. Um, we do have some teams that do, that do some more data processing and more um, when, when we're looking at big sets of data. Um, we've got a lot of mobility-related 